I'm really pleased here uh, to be with a nice crowd, both online and in person, uh, to hear a uh, talk on international debt, austerity, and decolonization at post-pandemic global health by the eminent uh, professor of global health and anthropology, James Pfeiffer. Uh, James is also director of uh, Health Alliance International, or so we learned recently, right. um, non, uh, no longer director because uh, it's been moved uh, uh, into uh, uh, local hands. And uh, really excited to hear this talk and to have you here, uh, James. Uh, help, please help me welcome James Weicker. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'll, I'll be talking mostly to the table here, try to address the camera from now and then. Uh, great to see a uh, really nice turnout and really exciting group of students doing really cool stuff. So really fun to be here. And thank you for the invitation, uh, Joseph. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'll jump right in. I guess shooting for like about 40 minutes for me to sort of talk. Um, I, I am not known for brevity, so I'm going to work hard at getting through these slides. This talk is going to be kind of introducing a lot of big ideas. I, I decided to kind of, after talking to Joseph, kind of uh, focus it on not knowing exactly how much any of you know about things like the IMF and austerity and all this. So a lot of some basic stuff. So if you already know this, you know, apologies for sort of uh, maybe not being so new to you, but hopefully some of this will be new and, and it'll provide a foundation for a discussion afterward. You know, what I would make the case are some of the really big issues going forward and how we do global health. Um, I just want to start by saying that I love the uh, title, The Study of the Longer Range Future. And I like it because it's optimistic. <laughs> and because uh, when I think about tomorrow, I, I have questions about the longer age future, but let's assume there will be one. And so that's, that's wonderful. So the title of the talk is International Debt, Austerity and Decolonization of Post-Pandemic Global Health. So there's a lot of big terms in there, big ideas, austerity, decolonization, what does that mean? Um, and so hopefully we can touch on all of that as I go through this. You'll notice that I have a logo of something called the People's Health Movement here. And this is a group that uh, the organization I used to be part of called Health Alliance International. We were the North American representative of the People's Health Movement. I think PIH was probably members for it. Um, and it's a global movement trying to push for social justice in, in global health and uh, an increased public funding for, for uh, services. Um, so that's why I just put it there in solidarity with them. Um, so this is just a, you know, decolonization of global health. Um, kind of want to root what I'm going to talk about in the big discussion. I'm not sure how much it's been a discussion around here. I'm sure it has come up. It is the term that is being used widely. I actually went to a, a conference at, at Harvard in 2018 that was organized by Harvard public health students around decolonization of global health. <laughs> Um, and uh, so the term has been out there. It's, you know, what does it mean? Where is it going? But I'm gonna make the case here as obviously not the only person that makes this case is that the relationship of the global North to the global South is very much dominated in the post-colonial period by debt and how debt functions uh, in terms of power and how, what it means for, for global health. So these are big ideas. Um, and what's the kind of activism that's going on uh, around um, uh, the international debt crisis? Um, I'm going to start with an African voice here, someone named Thomas Sankara, who was uh, president of Burkina Faso from 83 to 87, very tragically assassinated in 1987 under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, definitely a left wing leader. But um, he made a very famous speech uh, in 1987. It might seem like a long time ago, but it actually re has resonated to him until today at the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa. He said, debt's, debt's origins come from colonialism's origins. Those who lend us money are those who have colonized us before. They are those who used to manage our states and economies. Debt is neocolonialism, in which colonizers transform themselves into technical assistants we should better say technical assassins. Under the current form that is imperialism controlled, imperialism controlled debt is a cleverly managed reconquest of Africa. And I'm gonna make the case that I think he was spot on and I think he's still spot on. Um, I think that describes um, 
a really important sort of dimension of the relationship of the global north to the global south with powerful implications for how we do global health. The global health very much is not about health in developing so-called developing countries. Global health is about the relationship of the global north to the global south. It's about colonization and, and neocolonialism. That is that is what it is about. It's about the flow of money, resources, how, how that works. Um, I just threw this slide in because I, I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, PEPFAR, which is the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, was rolled out in 2003, 2004 by the Bush administration, of all things, um, and was the biggest massive increase in global health funding, really in the history of funding, changed the way global health is done. Many good things about it. It did enable the scale up of antiretroviral therapy around the world, and especially Sub-Saharan Africa. But um, most of that funding, um, billions of dollars, was channeled through American and, well, American, not, not even European contractors and NGOs, 95% of it, um, and did not flow to local institutions, nor did it tend to build local institutions. So this image uh, that I put these logos on top of is a very famous image of the Berlin Conference in 1884, where European powers came together to divide up Africa uh, and colonize it. And that led to something called the scramble for Africa. So they set the, the rules for who's going to get to control what parts of Africa. And at that meeting, so you can see the map of Africa in the back. And of course, there's not a single African in the room. And uh, I was at a PEPFAR meeting in Mozambique because HAI, the organization I work for, became the PEPFAR implementing partner for central Mozambique. And um, we sat in a room in the USAID building. And there were representatives from ABT, from FHI, from ICAP, from HAI, CDC, PEPFAR. It wasn't a single Mozambique in the room. And we were being told how Mozambique was going to be divided up by organization with millions of dollars, more than the Ministry of Health budget, to do all this work. And we just thought, we walked out, my colleague and I said, this felt like the Berlin Conference. <laughs> so uh, these are all logos of the big actors. I just thought I'd throw it out there. And we talk about kind of the relationship to colonialism. Who gets to control and manage these resources, these incredibly important resources about life and death, right? And still very much in the hands of the global north. Susan George is somebody that some of you may know, um, uh, well-known activist and political scientist, wrote a book called A Fate Worse Than Debt. Debt is a, such a powerful tool, is such a useful tool, is much better than colonialism ever was because you can keep control without having an army, without having a whole administration. So again, that link to the contemporary debt crisis all across the global south, which has just been made infinitely worse by the pandemic and the legacy and history of colonialism. So another voice from the global south, uh, Dr. Uh, Ivo Garrido, who was the uh, Minister of Health, um, was an activist, part of FRELIMO, one of the, the uh, part of the liberation of Mozambique in 1975 became uh, health minister in um, 2005 to 2010, and he came and gave a talk at the University of Washington and said, someone asked him, you know, how come we can't get ministries of finance to support more <clears throat> public health investment? And he said, there are no ministries of finance in Africa, there is just the IMF. And he talked about going in as a health minister in to meet with the finance minister in Mozambique. There'd be an IMF guy in person right beside him saying, nope, you don't get more health workers, right? They said, this is a budget envelope, you're gonna have to live within this. So again, that dynamic power, that dynamic of, of, of what people, some people will call neocolonialism. Um, I'm gonna just point to a really interesting piece that was in The Guardian that was actually referencing a study that came up called Financial Flows and Tax Havens Combining to Limit the Lives of Billions of People just a really interesting article that I think sort of captured um, uh, a relationship between the global south and global north of which debt is part and that is aid in reverse how poor countries actually develop rich countries and again that neo-colonial frame for global health and it just documents how the flow out of especially Africa of literally trillions of dollars to the global north in the form of profits coming from resource extraction, um, but also debt payment 
to Global North banks, to Global North institutions. Um, there's a net flow about four or five times as much. If you calculate it, do the math, about four or five times as much money, resources are flowing out of Africa as flow in form of aid or other kinds of investment. So it's a steady process of kind of impoverishment uh, and enrichment of the global north. And this is just a simple graph that shows since 1960, um, the growth and the disparity in uh, per capita GDP between countries of the global south and of the global north. Now, if you add China to the mix, China has been growing per capita GDP, that changes things a bit. But the main point here is simply, since colonial and formal colonialism ended, the disparity between the rich North and the global South has actually gotten significantly worse, right? And it sort of speaks to that idea that the way that the global uh, economy works now is actually more efficient than it was during formalized colonialism, right? They're able to extract value uh, more efficiently um, and to enrich global North. Um, so real quickly, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, but when we talk about international debt, um, you know, the, the countries of the global south uh, have taken on huge amounts of debt, often at higher in interest, it kind of depends on, on who the lender is. Uh, this has been going on since the 70s, the debt crisis really started then, and has never gone away. And again, it just seems like it's this constant drumbeat behind everything we do in so-called development. Um, that often flies under the radar. We're such a big thing, but but a lot of my global health colleagues, you know, to Washington, don't even think about it, don't know that much about it, but it actually frames everything we do. Um, so these can be loans from multilateral lend lending agencies. When I say multilateral, multi-government um, entities like the World Bank and the IMF, but there's these things called regional development banks, African development bank, uh, where wealthier countries contribute and then it gets loaned out. Usually this lending is at lower interest rates um, and is meant to be helpful lending, not just um, extractive. Then there are bilateral loans, government to government, right? Governments, wealthy countries will loan money to uh, uh, Global South countries. China has emerged as a major creditor really in the last 10 years. It has really grown um, as, as, a, as a huge actor. And then there's a lot of uh, private commercial creditors. Those can be investment banks. Um, those can be uh, private banks, um, credits from manufacturers. Private debt is growing, and this is it is a growing problem because they lie outside of the kind of debt relief packages that the G20 and the IMF <clears throat> World Bank organize. Um, now I showed this graph here. Maybe I can really, just to point out that in Lower income, I suppose I should use the pointer here. In lower income countries, private debt still is a relatively small piece. And so most of the debt is coming from bilaterals and multilaterals, IMF World Bank and that in countries, which means in principle, you can kind of tackle it in a more organized way in principle. Although we just saw at the IMF World Bank meetings in October that they're not tackling it. They're not doing the right thing. Middle income countries is much higher level of private debt that's accumulated. And this is increasingly seen as a huge challenge and a huge problem. Um, so what's this got to do with public health? Um, pretty straightforward. Don't want to oversimplify what when you dig down, it can get complicated. But the basic trade-off is if you're heavily in debt and your, your creditors are demanding debt repayment in many, many countries of the global south, they're paying three or four, even 10 times as much to debt service as they have available to invest in education and uh, health, right? So pretty direct relationship. If you gotta pay all this money back, you don't have money left over for public investment. So a huge part of the dynamic. Um, so uh, point three here, the WHO estimates that meeting SDG three will require companies with poor healthcare systems to spend at least 8.6% of GDP on healthcare by 2030. SDG three is what we call universal health coverage. SDGs are sustainable development goals embraced by the United Nations. And within that is the universal health coverage idea. And so the WHO is basically saying, we need to be boosting public spending. But how in the world is that going to happen, given the intensity of the current debt? Right? So we've got a real 
So WHO is part of the multilateral of UN agencies. And yet in that same world of multilaterals, you know, WHO is sometimes at those World Bank and IMF meetings promoting you know, this high spending while the World Bank and IMF are saying, uh, nope, can't do it. So uh, we're in a real bind here. Um, so there is a global movement to cancel the debt. Um, so, and the debt relief is a term you hear a lot. It can come in the form of, of many different things, but one is debt, just cancellation, forgiveness. Just say, we're wiping it off the books. You no longer owe us the money. Um, but you can also have what are called payment moratoriums. We'll look at an example of that where you delay, you suspend payments for a while. We saw something like that happen during the pandemic, which I'll talk about. You can get grants to pay off loan balances. The IMF will give the country a grant, which is almost like cancellation. And then concessionary loans, which means getting a low interest, sometimes even a zero interest loan, right, to pay back a high interest. Loan. So that's what IMF World Bank does. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, I won't read through all of this, um, but there's a great report, by the way, I've referenced here, which I encourage you to read called End Austerity, a Global Report on Budget Cuts and Harmful Social Reforms by Isabel Ortiz and Matthew Cummins, who are both um, spent a lot of time in the UN as, as health economists. Um, but they document um, basically the, 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 the pandemic created, not to your surprise, economic crisis across the globe. I think we still don't appreciate in this country how severe the economic crisis has been in much of the global south. It's created, a, there's a huge hunger crisis. We're in the worst food insecurity crisis we've seen you know, really since the 30s. Um, the you know, uh, economies really tanked in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. People lost jobs, incomes. There's tremendous rebuilding that has to happen. Um, and so countries took on more debt even while they're having some of their debt suspended, but the debt crisis has been amplified. Um, and what looks to be the case going forward is that Global North creditors, rather than canceling debt, rather than trying to get rid of it, providing generous packages to help countries rebuild, it's not their fault that a pandemic came along and created this uh, crisis, um, but they, it looks like there isn't much relief, meaningful relief on the way. And this is very, very concerning. So there was, in uh, 2020, the IMF World Bank and G20 got together and in the, their March meeting, and they developed something called the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, or DSSI, which suspended debt payments across, I think, 68, 70 countries across the global south. It basically said, you don't have to make your debt payments to the IMF or the World Bank or any of the G20 countries. Um, which are the rich global North countries and some emerging economies, so-called emerging economies. Um, and that was good, uh, that, you know, in principle, but the debt was still there, right? But they said interest will not accumulate, but you don't have to make debt payments. But that ended in, I'm embarrassed to say that ended in 2021. And so they've had to start making debt payments uh, again. But that was one effort. What was interesting though, and this is typical of the IMF and the World Bank, is recognizing, oh, now that we're in a massive health crisis, we'll give you a break. And what activists have been saying is, you know, you should give us a break beforehand because then the crisis won't be so bad, right? And this is exactly what happened in the Ebola uh, pandemic. It was, you know, the, all the, the countries that had the worst Ebola outbreaks were the ones that had the most severe austerity had been, not been allowed to invest in the public systems. Therefore, Ebola was worse. IMF comes along and says, oh, we'll give you a break now that the crisis is on us. And there was a very poignant um, exchange that got caught on video, went viral between the health minister of Guinea, who said, you know, <laughs> if you'd only given us this break five or 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation. And Christine Lagarde kind of hemmed and hawed and didn't know what to say. She was the, the, the head of the IMF at the time. Um, this is just an article to uh, how the wealthy world has failed four countries during the pandemic piece that came out in the New York Times talking about the IMF and the World Bank have just not responded in the way they need to. It's a good article. It's a little bit out of date, but kind of lays out the foundations. And this gets me to, this is about politics of global health, the politics of, of austerity and health. Um, and this is a through line 
even with the struggle on austerity going back to 1980 when the debt crisis got bad and austerity programs were rolled out, not only do countries have to pay back their debt, but they make deals with uh, IMF and World Bank and the G20 to uh, restructure their economies, to privatize, to undermine, make governments small, right? Neoliberalism. Um, so the politics of austerity have been with us for a long time, but it really wasn't until 2008 with the global financial crash that it really hit Europe. And some of you may remember, uh, especially Greece, um, countries of Southern Europe, especially Greece got hit very hard by austerity. And uh, there were massive demonstrations, you know, mil a million people in the streets in Italy, in, in, in Madrid, and in Athens protesting cuts to public services. One year, I think um, Greece fired something like 130,000 public health workers because they, you know, done this basically structural adjustment European style um, and with the European Union and I'm mm -hmm. in the lead and the people were screaming and yelling. Um, so it finally hit Europe, but people in Africa were saying, you know, we've been dealing with this for 30 years and now you get a taste of what this is all about. Um, Really quickly, um, what are the IMF and the World Bank? I'm not sure how many of you kind of track these, these murky institutions, but they were created in, at the end of World War II in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, of all places. Why there? I don't know. It's the middle of nowhere. Um, I should say it's nowhere. No microaggression for New Hampshire right here. Um, but the idea was how do we manage the Western capitalist economy to avoid another recession or another world war, right? That was the premise. So I'm the World Bank would lend, make big, uh, you know, uh, loans to countries to help them rebuild, especially after the war. IMF was going to stabilize the global economy, and kind of managing global exchange rates and that kind of thing. Won't go into too much detail there, but they are multilateral member uh, organizations, and the voting power is dependent on the size of your economy, how much weight you have. So as we can imagine, the United States is the most important member of both institutions. They are both based in Washington, D.C., uh, even though they're not American government institutions. Um, it's David Malpass, uh, unfortunately, is the president of World Bank, a Trump appointee and a nightmare. And then Kristalina Georgieva, who is the head of the IMF, who's an interesting figure who is, for lack of a better word, perhaps slightly more liberal than the previous IMF heads. You may know Jim Kim. Uh, who uh, became president of World Bank before David Malpass um, had less of a positive impact than World Bank I don't know what the PIH people think. Jim Kim, anthropologist physician who helped co-found Partners in Health. And so he's had an interesting career. Um, but they are the ones who organize, they're sort of empowered, tasked with organizing the world's uh, big donors and creditors to work out debt relief packages. And so that's where uh, uh, the, the idea of structural adjustment, that's their term, began in 1980. And uh, long story short, it was sort of an embrace of a new ethos, a new philosophy around finance that, that really reflected uh, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, the new conservative, ironically called neoliberalism, the uh, very, very uh, conservative approach to economics globally. Um, some people call structural adjustment Reaganomics on steroids, and it meant small government, privatization, reduction in public expenditures, and very importantly, uh, promoting non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations to fill gaps in social services, right? So it's an explosion of NGOs. Aid started to flow not to governments, but flowed to um, uh, non-governmental entities to kind of provide services. Um, very important book that came out uh, after the 2008 collapse called uh, the, the Body Economic Why Austerity Kills. I'm just referencing a little bit here, David Stuckler, somebody that I know Joseph knows, and Sanjay Bazu, um, the sociologist, health economist, They're talking mostly about Greece and, and Indonesia and some other countries, but it's a, it's a great book connecting the dots, austerity is the broader frame, cuts in basic services are what kill people, right? That make it difficult for us to improve public health. We have austerity in this country, you know, um, at the University of Washington, people are now to paying tens of thousands of dollars. I asked my students, have you experienced this austerity here? And they said, well, no, not really. It's like, well, 30 years ago, this education at University of Washington would have been free. 
So the fact that you're going hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt to get an undergraduate education is a result of austerity, right? So it's happening here as well. Um, I do want to say that in Africa, because it's been a slow burn, there's been less direct sort of mobilization than structural adjustment the way you saw it in Europe in 2008. But there have been moments. There's uh, Occupy Nigeria in 2012 it was a really interesting moment. They, they built off the Occupy Wall Street movement. It's called Occupy Nigeria. Muslims and Christians came together across a quite divided landscape, peaceful, mass uh, general strike shut the whole country down when the IMF with the government wanted to get rid of price subsidies. This is one of the parts of structural adjustment, let the free market set the price, which meant that people's costs for everything, transport, food, were gonna double literally overnight, 24 hour period. They forced the IMF to back down on that particular thing. So uh, just so you know, there is a lot of resistance um, and efforts at pushing back um, across Africa. Um, Paul Farmer, who we very sadly lost this year, um, he wrote about, um, you know, spent a lot of time in Sierra Leone um, and Liberia around the Ebola uh, outbreak in 2014. And uh, a number of people were kind of shouting and yelling, saying, you know, we need to understand why did it happen in these countries? Well, they had very weak health systems. Why did they have such weak health systems? Cote d'Ivoire didn't have an outbreak because it has a stronger health system. Why did it break out that? Well, all of those countries had been through quite stringent austerity programs. And Paul Farmer famously said, without staff, stuff, space, and systems, nothing can be done. So a great statement to basically say, if we're serious about combating these kinds of outbreaks, you got to have already existing public systems, right, to be providing places for people to get care, to get treatment. Um, so structural adjustment programs, just making the case, weakened national health systems starting in the 80s into the 90s and, and, and into the current period. Um, ministry health budgets were slashed. In Mozambique, we saw doctor salaries literally decline 70%, not like 10% or 5 like 70%, right? You can imagine mass flight, demoralization, all of that in the late uh, 80s and early 90s. Um, you basically have less funding, less public investment in the basics of a health system. And this is over on this uh, diagram I have here is the WHO has this famous kind of health systems uh, uh, building blocks idea. And you know all these building blocks, they need public investment or they're just not gonna work very well. So structural adjustment, austerity, debt being the reason why you in, engage in these structural adjustment programs really harm a country's ability to grow, develop, and um, <clears throat> create its, uh, a health system. So again, not knowing the background of everybody here, for so many of you, you already know this, but all across, especially Africa, but across the developing world, uh, most countries have something called a primary healthcare system. And most countries, people don't know this often until you've studied it, it grew out of a model that was developed out of a conference in Alma-Ata in, in Kazakhstan, it was Soviet Union, 1978, won't go into that whole story, where the country, the, the world came together, including the United States, Teddy Kennedy, everybody knows Teddy Kennedy. You know, I show, and I show an image when I teach this of Teddy Kennedy at Alma-Ata. I ask my students, does anybody know who this guy is? Nobody knows who he is. I'm like, how could you not recognize Teddy Kennedy? I think everybody in Massachusetts would. Anyway, we actually signed on to this. Health is a human right, it's not a commodity. Spreading out primary health care, basic services to everyone, right? And this is in post-colonial global South. This is what was lashed on. The ideas that came into this were often from the global South, including Mozambique, China, other places, models from Kerala State in India. What does a primary health care system look like? So, you know, they're public sector, right? In most cases. Um, and that means, you know, publicly financed, publicly funded. The health workers are, are government employees, are government, you know, like the United Kingdom. Um, human resources, infrastructure, all the things, training institutions, pharmacies, laboratories, logistics, m and &E data systems, strategic information, we call it. Research is part of a part of that, something that um, I've worked on with HAI in Mozambique, developing research capacity in the system itself. You're just making an obvious statement, but I think one that many American students don't recognize that in Africa, there are health systems 
that are run by Mozambicans or Kenyans or Tanzanians or Zimbabweans. But often what's presented to us is save the children is gonna parachute in and we're gonna save lives, right? It's like, well, there are health systems there. Why aren't they getting funded? Why aren't we donating to them? And that's what austerity is about, is these systems getting starved while NGOs are funded, faith-based organizations, and increasingly for-profit contractors like ABT and others are getting huge USAID grants and donor grants to do work parallel to public systems. So again, kind of that neo-colonial frame. Um, this is just a map of Mozambique where I've spent most of my time working. And every red dot is a health facility, right? So they've built over a thousand uh, health posts, rural health centers, hospitals, uh, trying to get as close to the people as possible. This is an interesting map because it shows the driving time to the healthcare center by color there. <laughs> So even in spite of the fact they've done a really good job of getting out there, there's still thousands of Mozambicans who really can't get to a health post. So what we should be doing, if we're doing good global health, is investing massively in building more infrastructure. People don't have cars. They don't even have roads in some cases. you got to have a building out there. You've got to have a cold chain for vaccines. All that takes public investment. We're not doing that in global health. And uh, there was a huge surge after Alma Ata, and then it hit a brick wall with austerity and structural adjustment in the 80s. But Mozambique, in spite of being one of the poorest countries in the world, has done a phenomenal job with how little they have of getting healthcare out to its population. Before, just make a point that won't surprise you, before 1975, 90% of Africans in Mozambique had no access to any kind of biomedical care at all. So after 1975, independence, first priority, get basic health services out to the people. And they did an amazing job, given the odds they were against. So, but when you hear about appeals for funding for global health, you're like, we're going to save children's lives, sponsor a child in Mozambique. None of those folks mention the national health system where poor people get their care. Um, this is just an example for those of you who haven't done. This is what a rural health center, pretty big health center looks like in Mozambique does not look exactly like Mass General, um, but uh, good care is being provided here. Could be better, um, but these are women and children waiting for uh, well child visits, having child growth monitoring, that kind of thing. Um, but this is the kind of bricks and mortar that needs to be out there, right, to bring care. This is where people can get COVID vaccines as well, right? Got to have an infrastructure. Just an example, these are maternal child health nurses. You can see the Salter scale on the left for growth monitoring. A uh, huge demand, you know, if anyone tells you, oh, you build services and, uh, you know, people in poor communities, they won't come or whatever. They line up, they wait for hours to get their care. They want it. They want more of it. The true, by the way, the true heroes of global health are these women here, are the frontline maternal child health nurses that provide 80% of the care for the world's population. And if you want to know what's really happening with global health, you'll talk to them. They will tell you don't talk to a head of an NGO. Don't even talk to the high-level Mozambican doctor in the ministry. Talk to the MCH nurses, and they'll say what's working and what's not working. And so that's something we need to do a lot more of. Here's an image. This is just a coronavirus uh, crisis appeal. Uh, I just throw some logos in there. But I, I have these images because, you know, Doctors Without Borders, there's, they do a lot of good in the world deeply problematic in other places. They sometimes do parallel stuff, plunk down, have their, their young French doctors who think they know everything. They wear scarves and strut around and like, and the Mozambican doctors kind of roll their eyes. But, you know, the appeal is, oh, look, you know, there's a logo, MSF, there's all this stuff. And these are often in countries that have national health systems, but you send money to MSF because, you know, you assume that, oh, you know, they don't have any health care in Burkina Faso, right? So it must be MSF. They're going to bring the health care. It's like, you know, lack of consciousness. And in fact, there are local institutions that need our help. Um, this is an old slide. I apologize. I just didn't have time to get the new numbers. This is taken from the World Health Report 2006, but they did the World Health Report it comes out of the WHO every year. They focused on workforce that year. It has some good data in it. Um, it's just to show that there's this WHO standard of 20 doctors per 100,000. Um, 
And places like Malawi, Mozambique, and many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, they need 10 times as many doctors just to get to the bare minimum, which is really not acceptable either, of 20. We're not even close, we're not even in the ballpark in Mozambique. And you know, compare it to Cuba, <clears throat> by the way, 600. That's why, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why they have better public health outcomes than the United States, even though we are 20 times richer. Um, but you can, you know, compare South Africa is a little bit of a, uh, you know, inequality is not captured here. Most of those doctors are treating wealthy uh, white customers or other wealthy folks. So poor areas of South Africa have very few health workers, unfortunately. Um, but just to give you an example, make a simple point. We are so far behind the game in terms of just the basics of bringing health care. And here we have austerity, we have debt in which countries are not allowed to, literally not allowed to expand their health workforce because they have, they owe money to Credit Suisse. Um, so SDGs and UHC, Joseph has written extensively about this. So I, I, I point you to his work <laughs> to learn more. It's actually technically 3.8 is the universal health coverage one, um, which is interestingly written, achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health services and access to safe, effective quality and affordable essential vaccines and vaccines for all. I cut one slide which says, um, without causing financial harm or risk to the consumer, any thought? In contrast to Alma Ata, which said, healthcare for all shouldn't be a commodity. You feel like the new UHC is like leaves a little space for it being a commodity and health insurance. Um, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders isn't out there saying we want universal health coverage. He's saying we want universal health care. And I just have a sense there might be a little difference in the language. And I'm not sure what Joseph um, knows about that language. Uh, so some basics here, universal health coverage. This has been the clarion call for the last few years in global health. We should, we should be shooting for this. It's in the SDGs. Isn't this what we're supposed to all coalesce around? That everyone is somehow gonna have access to healthcare in a way that doesn't impoverish them in terms of cost and all that. Um, so the WHO says we need uh, 18 million additional health workers by 2030, You know, mostly in the global south. Um, the minimum standard of one physician per 1,000 to support universal health coverage, 4.5 per 1,000 for all skilled health workers. Just making the, the, the point here, again, minimum standard, which is really minimum. And I just give some numbers here where, you know, we're just miles away from that in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. How are we going to get there with the kind of debt that's hanging over the head of Global South and the kind of austerity measures that are being imposed that say, nope, you can't do this public spending. You're not allowed to. You can have a bunch of NGOs if you want, but you don't get to build your own national health service. Uh, you have to pay back your debt. Uh, now, COVID, um, by the way, Debt Justice UK used to be called Jubilee uh, UK. Um, there was a big debt relief movement in the late 90s. Um, people like Bono were involved. Bono. Does anybody know who Bono is? Old rock star. Um, getting old. Um, but it was Jubilee came out of uh, the Bible, right? At the millennium, all debts will be forgiven. The Jubilee was about debt forgiveness. Um, and it had a lot, it got a lot of attention and there was some work. So the Jubilee, there's a Jubilee USA and then there's a Jubilee UK, but Jubilee UK has just changed to debt justice. I'm not sure why they changed their name, but they're a very, very good resource. Uh, and they just make the, the case uh, again, that there's more being spent on debt than on public institutions. Uh, 64 countries spend more on external debt payments than on public health care. Um, and COVID is just making this you know, infinitely worse. So just to be clear, why does this matter? In a global South place, let alone the United States, you need PPE, right? Per personal protective equipment. Well, I'll show another slide saying, when did personal protective equipment get to the Mozambique National Health System, never got there. Even with hundreds of millions of dollars going to American NGOs and contractors, none of them in Mozambique, none of them contributed any PPE. It's just, it's phenomenal, right? It's just basic, how do you protect the workforce? Testing, contact tracing, trained healthcare providers, you need hospital beds and ICU units. You need ventilators, you need data systems, right? Data is important. Community outreach, vaccination, treatment, lockdown and quarantine, 
uh, in other words, a functioning public sector health system, right? That's what countries in the global south need. It's what we need <laughs> and don't have, but they need it even more. And so when we talk about pandemic preparedness going forward, what's happening around this, right? Because as I was telling Joseph in our earlier discussions, the, the pandemic was a epic global health failure an epic public health failure in this country, right? There are some countries that actually did pretty pretty well with this because they had heavy investment in their public institutions. But, you know, what are we going to learn from this? And if we can't do all of these things in Mozambique, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, or for that matter, Pakistan, um, Yemen, around the world, the countries that need it most, then we're not even in the ballpark of handling the pandemic. So the Mozambique COVID experience, um, there was no PPE at all during the first year of the pandemic for 4,000 national health service workers who were the ones providing the frontline care when they had a huge wave of COVID cases. So at one point, there were 40% of the health workforce was absent in one of the biggest provinces in Ambasia. I know I, don't, I haven't seen data from others, but you had 40% of your health workforce out during a pandemic because partly because they didn't have PPE, right? Very sporadic testing and contact tracing. There was a little bit in the cities, but not really. Hospital lids and ICU units were just completely overflowing, where people were basically dying at home. Uh, there were only at the start of the pandemic, 30 ventilators in the entire country. And a year into the pandemic, there were still only 30 ventilators in the entire country. Um, the data systems were unable to track and share information. PEPFAR has put millions of dollars into creating HIV related data systems that have no relationship or connection to the health system data systems. And the Ministry of Health has to beg for data from them. But rather than those PEPFAR partners saying, how can we help you know, support the Ministry of Health COVID data gathering, uh, they were absent and silent. Uncoordinated community outreach and education, they just don't have the people. Uh, you need to have trained community uh, health workers and enough of them. Little or no access to vaccination for health workers or population. You have to have a functioning health system to get vaccines out. They actually have quite a good vaccination system. They have good coverage of the routine vaccines. Um, but so many people were out sick that they couldn't get them out. And of course, I imagine you know that um, we couldn't get vaccines to Africa because of the behavior of big pharma. Whole other story that we can talk about. Um, and then there is now ongoing austerity predicted for Mozambique in the post-pandemic. They're deeply in debt. They're identified as one of the most uh, distressed countries. So what are we gonna learn from this experience? We've just been shown how bad things can go when you don't have a functioning public system. When you have all of this, hundreds of millions, there's about $400 million a year goes to American contractors. It's more than the entire Ministry of Health budget. None of those resources, until maybe a little bit this last year, none of them during the pandemic went to help the national health system fight the pandemic. It's, it is truly scandalous. It's a story that has to be told. Um, so I encourage students if you want to do an interesting dissertation project and say, what did foreign organizations do to help global South countries with the COVID pandemic? And you will be shocked at how little that they did, by and large, at least my experience in Southern Africa. Um, so getting to debt relief more specifically, um, uh, you know, my favorite guy, a health economist, Larry Summers, I'm joking, has said, uh, described the debt suspension initiative, the DSSI, he called it a squirt gun meeting a massive conflagration. Larry Summers is not kind of our guy, but he's saying stuff like this, right? He was also the... He got thrown out of Harvard, right? And then what was his secretary of the treasury? Uh, but he pays attention to these things and he was very public about this saying, we have a, a tsunami of debt. And so uh, the head of Oxfam uh, who manages debt policy, the failure to cancel debt payments will only delay the tsunami of debt that will engulf many of the world's poorest countries, leaving them unable to afford the investment in healthcare and social safety nets so desperately needed. Um, this is another, I won't read through all of this, but another article, it came out in 2020, but I think still nails it in the Lancet, decolonizing COVID-19, delaying external debt payments. And it sort of talks about, frame, helps frame, it's a good reference if you want to learn more and read more about this. Um, and, and linking it 
to connecting it to the idea of neocolonialism and how debt is is used as the system of extraction uh, from global south to global north. Um, so in terms of social movements, this is a wonderful letter to the IMF that came out in 2020 by a bunch of, um, you know, the, the sort of global movements led by civil society organizations, Oxfam, Bretton Woods Project, great resources, the International Trade Union Confederation, which is called Public Self Sector Workers, Bureau Dad, Latin Dad, and Afro Data, and I didn't have that in there, are development uh, or, or debt um, uh, relief organizations, Human Rights Watch, Jubilee USA, Arab Watch Coalition. You know, this is just a partial. There's hundreds that have signed on to this letter. But time and time again, rigid and, and rapid fiscal consolidation, which is austerity, conditioned in IMF programs has meant devastating cuts in health and education, investments, loss of hard-earned pensions, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, you can access the full letter. It, it really kind of lays it out very hard. So the good news is there is a global movement trying to push for uh, debt cancellation, debt relief to get a focus on this. Um, I would say that there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. I feel like it hasn't gelled completely yet. I think partly because of the pandemic, everything feels fragmented, including social movements. But people are working very hard and trying to pull this together. The Jubilee movement really gelled much better way back. I um, mean, we had the WT uh, uh, demonstrations in Seattle where there was a lot of call for debt relief. There were actually, I attended a demonstration, 20,000 people in Washington, D.C., marching to the World Bank, calling for an end to structural adjustment. I thought I'd never see this. It's such a wonky thing. Thousands of young people demanding. Um, we're not there yet, but hopefully uh, maybe something will gel in the, in the years ahead. Um, the longer range future, the optimism. Um, this is just a list of things that comes out of the Ortiz and Cummins uh, End Austerity Report, which is, I think, a really great resource uh, for you all. All the things we could be doing to make this situation better, and I won't read through all of these, but um, there's a whole range of, of, uh, of, of other ways of handling debt um, in the real world right, um, that uh, we should be focusing on trying to, to emphasize. So other good news, which I'm convinced is going to change the world, is that a group of us at the University of Washington have authored a proposed American Public Health Association statement calling for debt cancellation. And it's gone through two rounds of review since spring, and literally tomorrow, so you know, pray, that the governing council of the APHA will actually adopt this. And we, th we think they will, fingers crossed, because there's been no pushback at this point. They have a joint policy committee that reviews and they've given the full endorsement. Um, and so it'll become a formal statement of the American Public Health Association calling for, for uh, debt cancellation um, and increased public investment. Will this change the minds in the IMF and World Bank? Probably not, but hopefully we're thinking it's going to be a useful tool, you know, that people can use. The reason why I think it might be valuable and that we did not waste our time doing this is that uh, several years ago, a group from the University of Washington, most from the University of Washington, put out, a, this is before the George, George Floyd um, uh, murder, put out a statement on declaring police violence a public health issue. So very well researched with all the data. And that got approved, I think, in 2017 or 2018. And so when George Floyd happened, media uh, uh, were, were throwing this around. It, it went viral. The APHA was saying this, the police violence is a public health concern. So you never know when stuff like this becomes important, right? So we're, we're kind of feeling, you know, happy that this happened. So since many of the references here were actually published before it became clear that we're heading into real economic turbulence, higher interest rates, um, and perhaps a global recession, everything I mentioned is even more severe. And the World Bank now have just had their October meetings, and everyone who's on the social movement side came away just incredibly disappointed. There just seems to be no consensus, no real planning, no real instruments. So there is this thing called the Common Framework. Did I mention the Common Framework yet? I don't think I did. So, so there's the DSSI, which ended 
right, which is the suspension. Now there's something called the Common Framework, which was technically rolled out by the G20 with the support of IMF, G20, again, rich countries that have, are creditor countries. The Common Framework is meant to be a mechanism that uh, more indebted countries can apply and go through a process and get major, major debt relief, maybe even some debt cancellation. It's so onerous and difficult to get through that I think only three or four countries have even gotten through the first door. It is widely seen as a failure. It does not appear that there's anything meaningful to replace it. There is no debt relief major plan in the works at the moment coming from the big, you know, the G20, IMF, World Bank, those big actors. So, uh, and now we have this crisis. And of course, when the crisis hits, uh, you know, all the rich countries also start to pull back. And as I understand it, DFID, which is the USAID of the UK, has cut its school health budget massively. So we may see a real decline in global funding, perhaps. Um, but then we have austerity as well. I'm going to end on an African voice. This is uh, Ivo Garrido, who we invited to UW to give a talk at the 40th anniversary of the Alma Ata. Uh, declaration. Um, and so he came in 2018. And uh, this is a quote from his talk. Um, uh, he said, health systems are a country's mechanism for taking care of its people. If you want to help strengthen the National Health Service. So this is simple. This is not what we've been doing. In fact, we've been weakening National Health Service in many cases. Um, so um, that is sort of the bottom line. And we can't do that with austerity and debt. So some links um, that you can uh, track down and the slides can be distributed. Um, there's a lot more than this, but I encourage you to read the Declaration of Alma Ata if you want to read a really cool thing. It wasn't really pragmatic, but it's a pragmatic. It's a beautiful statement um, that you will all agree with. And amazingly, Teddy Kennedy signed on to that. Um, resources for action. Those of you who want to get involved, right? This, this is a moment. We're talking about the politics of global health. Uh, things are in such turmoil now that this is a really important movement for activism to engage for people like us to use our positions in universities to, to really jump in and, and, and try to work on, on debt and austerity and social justice and health. Um, there are other issues beyond this, Internet, uh, intellectual property rights um, on COVID vaccines and COVID treatments, for example, is a huge issue. But these are a whole bunch of, of, of great places to uh, get information and join the, uh, join the struggle. Obrigado is what we say in Portuguese, say thank you. I would say that HAI, I'm very proud of this too. We did work in our own uh, local community in Seattle. And my wife, Rachel Chapman, who's an anthropologist, we recently uh, got a grant. We're working on bringing um, uh, better antenatal care in very, very poor communities in South Seattle where, where women aren't getting into services because they don't have insurance, they can't get to a healthcare provider. And all we can think is, well, boy, this feels all like Mozambique right here in this country. So mm -hmm. there is plenty of the same work, same dynamics to do right here, uh, obviously, in the United States. So I'm going to stop there.